Um, no loss is easy to take. Let's start with that. But I thought that the Minnesota team played a tremendous football game against us. I've always said in this league, if you're not ready to play every week, that somebody can come along and knock you off. And uh, we had been a, a mistake-free team the last few games. And then all of a sudden, we had at least, well, four legitimate turnovers, probably had uh, six or seven other critical big mistakes. And when you do that, your chances of winning against a team like Minnesota are not very good. One thing it does do, though, is it proves what you've said all along is right, and we scoff at you sometime when you say, hey, these guys can beat anybody. Right. And you're talking about anybody, and it happened to be <laughs> Minnesota, and it happened to be you this week. Well, you, you look at the conference, and the conference has been pretty much that way. Although Ohio State has not lost a game, um, there have been close games, there have been upsets, and uh, it's just that kind of a league. Nothing happened the entire first quarter. Then finally, you started to get some things going against Minnesota at the end of the first quarter. Was there any adjustments made? We struggled early and uh, didn't play well. Our first series of downs were three plays and punting. We jockey back and forth, and then finally we get the ball here late in the first period, and Jamie gets outside for a decent gain, and, you know, it kind of looks like maybe we might get something going. Were there any surprises they gave you defensively at all? No, not really. They just played good defense, which we knew they would. Actually, Jim, there have been people that have been successful against them throwing the ball, but not too many people have run on them a lot. And um, and we didn't do a good job running the ball. If we'd have run the ball a little better, I think we'd have been all right. Here, Jim scrambles, forgets to put the ball away, gets hit from behind. Anytime you cross the line of scrimmage, you're no longer a viable passer. you got to get that ball up in your armpit. And those are the mistakes you're talking about. That's what I'm talking about. You can't do those things and expect to win games. Here they... We force a punt after three plays, and, and uh, the ball bounces off of Tony Gant's chest, and they recover and get the ball to 13. And um, during the course of that drive, here's a fumble that we recovered. But they, they gave the ball to Minnesota. They called the ball dead. They called uh, the ball dead. Yes, and, uh, and so, um, so they end up with a third and 12 situation and hit this pass right in the corner under pressure. He hits the pass in the corner for a touchdown, and that's the first score of the game. It seems like in games where you get upset, all the breaks go against you, and that's what happened. Now, now, wait a minute, Joe. Yeah, well, breaks go against you, but, you know, you got to make your own breaks in this game. And we didn't make any. We, uh, on the um, ensuing kickoff following their touchdown, we screen pass here to Jamie and get a good gain and uh, start to move a little bit here. Um, hits Jamie out in the flat here, and we cross the 50. This is after a penalty. Um, we're down in there going well, and we get a penalty and sets us back. And on a third and 12 here, uh, Jim goes back, hits Jamie again, and makes a big play out of this. I thought did a great job getting outside here and getting the first down deep in their territory. The Minnesota appears to be giving you some underneath things, but they're taking away everything deep. That's right. Well, we, we went deep in the first series, didn't get it. And um, here we have, we were forced to kick a field goal here to make the score seven to three uh, in the second period. Then the kickoff, Jim. Uh, this is an amazing. Three well, times. Now we're kicking into the wind and kicking for the corner. The wind holds the ball up and it kicks back to us and we recover. It's the third time we've done that this year. And uh, it's a successful play. I thought, did you think like I did, that maybe that was the spark to get things well, going? You know, you always hope something like that will liven you up. And we did. Here's a great catch by McMurtry for a first down uh, at around the 16-yard line. And... Um, and we do capitalize on this uh, break and take it in to score, but uh, I don't know. We just didn't uh, play like I, uh, you know, I expected our team to play. Here's a sweep. Jamie gets down in close. Um, and then on the first play here, we give the ball to Wilshire, who runs hard in here, breaks some tackles, and goes into the end zone to give us the lead. And at halftime, it's 10 to 7. Now, you haven't played well. You've got to feel, at that point, going off the locker room, fairly confident, like, well, we can make some adjustments and get some things going. Boy, we're lucky to escape with the lead. We did not play well. We went in at halftime and had 200 yards of offense. So it wasn't a matter that we couldn't move the ball or we didn't have the potential to score. We were just making horrendous mistakes, penalties, fumbles, drop punts, uh, badly called plays. We just had one thing after another. And uh, to be honest with you, Jim, I couldn't straighten it out. It just uh, it just kept mushrooming, and we never played well, in my opinion, from beginning to the end of the game. The sad conclusion, the sad second half, is coming up as Michigan Replay continues.
Wolverines led 10 to 7 at half, and the second half they were receiving the kickoff. You said at halftime you you try to make adjustments and things, you, but you just couldn't get anything going. You couldn't. Well, you know, you, you anticipate that you're going to come out and move the football and uh, and get things straightened out, but we, we end up getting nine yards in the first series and the fourth and one in our own territory and forced to punt. Normally, Michigan really owns the third quarter, have for the last couple of years, but this year it just didn't happen. Any reason? I can't tell you that. Uh, you know, it just uh, it was the entire game, Jim. There was a third quarter, first quarter, fourth quarter, you name the quarter. Here we throw a little um, pass, a, a, a quick out pass, and uh, Jim uh, throws an interception here, which gives them a great field position again. Um, we had done a good job on this um, option play up until this play, and there are two of them in this drive that uh, they work effectively, and, and here's the second one here. Uh, this time they load on the end, which means they block the end rather than option it. And uh, Foggy kept the ball and went outside for a big game. And speaking of Foggy, he made have had his best game of the season without question. Jim, I've seen all the film. This is the best he's played all year, but he is a uh, he's a fine athlete. And here we just we keep jockeying with him, and he jockeys with us and <laughs> runs in the end zone. And uh, so we end up trailing 14 to 10. 14 to 10. But once again, Jim, it's a turnover in our territory, and. You just can't afford to do that. And here comes more bad news. I, I honestly did not see a fumble here. He's on the ground. The ball rolled out after he's on the ground. Some official thought it was a fumble, gave it to him. So now we're in real trouble because they've got the ball down in there ready to score again. And uh, come right out and give the ball to the fullback for a good game. Uh, we finally get him stopped down here, force him to go to the field goal. And they kick the field goal to go on top 17 to 10. But Jim, we're lucky. We've turned that ball over twice deep in our own territory. The other thing is, with them still in the game or them in the game, that means they can go to that option attack and they can control the clock. To beat Minnesota, you've got to get them down. Once you get them down and they have to throw the ball rather than play the option, here's a great play in, uh, by Greg McMurphy on a pass over the middle uh, from Harbaugh uh, that really gets us in good field position and a chance. Fourth and nine. Uh, once again, Jim goes to McMurphy who makes the big catch here for the first down and uh, keeps our drive alive. And you're driving uh, down 17, 10, fourth quarter right. late. Here they come with a blitz. We run the draw and crack it, and uh, Jamie gets down right to about the seven-yard line. That was a big play um, that helped us a lot in there. This is fourth and goal from the one-yard line, and uh, White dives over, crosses the plane, but lost the ball after he got over there. But as you know, once you cross the plane or goal line, that is a touchdown. Real quickly, you kicked a tie. Any thought of going for two? Yes, we thought about it. Uh, but um, uh, first of all, there were two and a half minutes left. Uh, we wanted to take our chances. Second of all, with a tie, we could still go into Columbus and beat Ohio State and win the title outright. The way it is now, we can't do that. Here they come on their drive, the game winner. This, is the, this is the big play. Right, this is the big play. We, the 31-yard uh, play that um, the scramble by uh, Foggy that gets them in position to kick the field goal. Low Miller from oh, 35 it's 30 yards. Yard, 30 yard. The ball's on the 20. It was a chip shot, and, and they win the game. And, and Jim, they deserve to win it. Let's make no mistake about that. Uh, this was, in my opinion, the play of the game because there was very little time left on the clock when uh, Foggy went back to pass here, and uh, everybody was pretty well covered and he took off running and he had people diving around and, and the cornerback is never to allow a, a, a ball carrier outside of him and he did and they went down and uh, get into position to kick the field goal. And that was the Budweiser play of the game. Do you ever get premonitions prior no. to games? You know, <laughs> ever going thinking, boy, maybe this is the day or you're feeling like... Well, maybe some of our players felt that way, <laughs> but I didn't. Uh, not at all. Uh, let me say this again. Teams that have beaten Minnesota have been able to jump on top. If you get two touchdowns on top, you take them out of the wishbone, you take them out of that possession attack, uh, eating up the clock, uh, going for first downs. And then you force them into a game that they do not like to play. And that's it. That's the pass. The straight drive back that's and roll right. out. That is not their game, and they can't do it effectively. And uh, But we kept them in the game all afternoon, just kept them in the game, kept them in the game. When that happens, then you're giving them a chance to win. You were quoted Saturday after the game. I heard you on an interview where you said the, the kids seemed maybe a little tight. Did, did you still Well, I, I anticipated that a little bit because, uh, you know, playing the last game in the stadium and everything. But, gee, I, I didn't think it would last that long. 
In other words, you snap out of those things pretty quickly and start to play hard. But, uh, you know, maybe, um, let's, let's say this. The day that we played Minnesota, Minnesota was a better team than Michigan. Let's make no mistake about that. Let's don't alibi our way out of that thing. They were better than us. Over the long haul, a uh, whole season, uh, maybe they're not. But that day, let's give credit to Minnesota. They beat Michigan no matter how you add it up. And uh, going into the thing, you've got to go back to work and go back to the drawing board, obviously. But there's still some places, to obviously, you can improve. I mean, after looking at that performance on Jim, Saturday. if you can't improve after looking at that film, then you don't, uh, you're not much of a coach. There are going to be a million things in there that you can uh, improve. But we have a big game coming up. And the question is, uh, how hard do you go after that? And uh, because we've got to bring this team back, and we've got to go into Columbus, and we've got to go in there thinking we can win that game. Coming up, we've got an up story about a great youngster, so don't go away. That's next when Michigan Replay continues. In an age of specialization, some football players distinguish themselves with their versatility. They do all things well. For Michigan, Gerald White fits that description. In the Wolverine offense, he is solid and steady, just like a rock. Like a rock, I was strong as I could be. Like a rock, nothing ever got to me. Like a rock, I was something to see. Like a rock. White came in as a highly recruited, very visible tailback, but made the move to a less visible fullback position and never complained. It was an adjustment, but Gerald White is the kind of young man who could make it. At first it was kind of hard because, you know, used to running the ball and not blocking that much, it was, you know, a hard decision. I made a hard move for me to make, but knowing that I was the biggest tailback and I would be moved to fullback because, you know, we only had one fullback at the time, I know I was going to make the transition and I like it a lot now. It's a lot different. Um, I don't mind because I, I think the things that I do are for the team and I like being a team ball player to get things done that need to be done. And the headlines and the press is, you know, it's fun and, you know, it's dandy when it comes along, but it's not something that I thrive on, so it doesn't bother me that much. In addition, Michigan's team concept fits Gerald to a T. It's a lot different than in high school. High school, there's like two or three players that kind of stand out and they're always getting publicized, and I don't think that's very fair. And up here, it's more of a team concept. We don't really have any one or two people that really seem to stand out all the time and he doesn't promote one or two players and it's always a team concept and I like that a lot. How did Gerald White graduate? What's next? I think the next thing is opening up my own business. I'd like to get into the sporting good business and have my own sporting good shop. Eventually get into owning my own sports agency, recruiting and promoting players, you know, for professionalism and uh, spending a lot of time with the family. Any thoughts about professional football yourself? Not especially. I think it would be nice if it happened, if I just so happened to get lucky and be one of the few that got drafted, then it would be ha I would be happy and, you know, try it for a while, see what it's like. If not, I'm always having a backup. Like a Gerald White, one of the real nice stories of college football. And he's really the kind of young man that epitomizes the kind of he's a gentleman. athlete that yeah. collegiate football produces. He's a, he's a real gentleman, fine person, and, and a tremendous athlete. Um, fun to be around. He's just uh, quality. And he's been around from Florida. You got Gerald from Florida, and he's actually moved well, up to Ann Arbor. Actually, Gerald uh, lived uh, a lot of different places. He moved around a lot in his youth. And he liked the change of seasons. That's one of the reasons he came to Michigan. I don't know whether he liked how cold it was in this <laughs> game. But anyway, he liked the change of seasons. Well, Gerald White is one of the players that Michigan fans can honor at the annual Michigan football bust. 
And there are still tickets available, although they're going fast. The 66th annual Michigan football bust, it'll be held Tuesday, November 25th at 7 o'clock at the Weston Hotel in Detroit. For information, ticket information, call Bob McLean at area code 313-971-4115. That's a little earlier than normal because of the Hawaii game for Michigan this year. That date, Tuesday, November 25th at 7 for information, call Bob McLean at 313-971-4115. And for those of you interested in going, Dan Deerdorf will be the MC. Dan, a former All-American at Michigan, and I'm the kind of guy that likes to say I pushed Dan Deerdorf into being as good as he was. Because I, <coughs> I played behind Dan, you know, two years. and Way, without... <laughs> way behind. Yeah, but without me, he wouldn't have been the great player that he was because I pushed him to that greatness. Well, that's it. That's, that's... Nice of you to think that way, Jim, that you made that contribution. <laughs> <laughs>